record on this computer. Oh boy. Okay. So looks like Caitlin. Yeah, I saw this 20 gigabytes of stuff from Intel. Yeah. So if, if Intel is not already having a tough enough time with their delays with their uh, 10 and 7 nanometer chips, uh, they just got a, a major data breach. And it has a bunch of their intellectual property, including uh, the source code for a bunch of their platforms, the KB Lake, like BIOS references, um, debug builds for various platforms, uh, the stuff that you, 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 as Intel, it's their, you know, proprietary, um, their proprietary sauce. It's what makes them money. It, it's what separates them from AMD. And now AMD has all their stuff too. So, <laughs> Yeah, but of course, this, from what I've heard, this is not like super top secret stuff. This is stuff they share with like their business partners. Supposedly. Yeah. So in fact, it sounds like they did share it with a Chinese company and they lost it. So, so you know, it's not quite, it's not like it was PII with passwords or anything. It's just, oh, no, no, of course not. It's just uh, another. Like proprietary specs and stuff. Yeah. Just Intel's having a hard time right now. And this just compounds the issue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And so I got a bunch of stuff about coronavirus that I thought was kind of fun. Oh, they see it's hitting everywhere. Um, the, uh, there was this student that took a picture of how crowded the hallways were, which is pretty impressive. I remember this is exactly what I used to find in high school. The debate over reopening schools. She get rid of this garbage. Okay. So, you know, and that's just what it is like. So if everyone says we should open the schools and everything will be fine. I remember it being just like this. In fact, I remember my cool thing was I would learn how to go really fast through this, weaving among all the people without touching any of them. It was like playing pinball. That was what I did in grade school. But, you know, this is what it is. And they're trying to pretend that's fine. And this student said, nobody wears a mask. And the high school principal said, oh, well, we can't enforce any rules like anyone wearing masks. And I said, when I went to school, there were tons of stupid rules and they enforced them. I remember the principal coming down to saw the padlock off my locker because he said, we have to trust each other. No one's allowed to lock their locker. And they're ton full of rules. They can talk, they'll stop you and impound you for cell phone or something. There's no way they can't enforce mask yeah. rules. But of course, the problem is the parents will tell their kid, they can't make you wear a mask. So that, that would be the problem. Yeah. Tom and I were talking about this story yesterday. And one of the funny and sort of disgustingly ironic things about it is that uh, they made an announcement over the school speakers saying that anyone who posts anything negative uh, or pictures like this on social media uh, will be punished and uh, that they have a policy that you can't post anything uh, without negative or without permission of school administrators. Yeah, which is completely unconstitutional. Right. So it's like, okay, you can enforce that rule, but yeah. you can't enforce a mask rule. Yeah. And also, one thing that's really screwed up about this is this school system had a bunch of, they had like slots where you could sign up to uh, uh, attend school from home remotely. And they only had a very small number of those slots available. And of course, they all filled up. And so they're saying, well, uh, by and large, the vast majority of the parents signed their kids up for in-person school because they had no other option. Yep. yep. That's what I, I know. I'm, I remember grade school is where I first learned about really tyrannical authority. They just had an idiot passing stupid rules that made no sense all the time and tried to shove you around. It was really preparation for for living in trump's america really but the anyway. school nurse also the school nurse quit because she was like i don't want to have any part in this it's irresponsible <laughs> yeah and um and they did throw out the student for posting this stuff it reminds me years ago like five years ago there was a student that took a cell phone in class because the teacher was just screaming racist stuff in class and so he recorded them so they punished the student for posting the recording and banned all cell phones that was how they solved that problem I got in trouble when I was in high school for publishing a uh, illegal newspaper with my friends. We had a zine called the Sadist Quo, kind of like the Status Quo. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We, like, wrote mean things about the administrators, and then uh, and <laughs> which we thought were funny, and then photocopied them and handed them out at school. And we had like an editor and issues every month, and then we got caught, and we had to like clean the school bathrooms. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did things like that too. That's before there was the internet, before there was 4chan, right. you did things like that with paper. So now they just suspend you for putting it on Facebook or something. If they don't accuse you of terrorism and lock you in juvie. Right. Um, but anyway, so, so now this, I think is kind of amazing in America. New York now has uh, closed the borders and they got checkpoints. And if you try to travel into New York city from any of 35 States, they will hunt you down and try to make you quarantine which is very interesting, and I'm sure it's completely illegal. I'm sure they couldn't possibly justify this in court, but I do think it's a good idea. But I'm sure that uh, you could go there from like a, a place all full of infection like Texas and demand your rights, and they'd have no, there's no actual internal federal standard for closing the borders, but New Jersey did it too. And um, this I thought is very interesting. More than half of Americans now know someone who's been infected with coronavirus. So, uh, and that was, you know, a few months ago, it was very small. So this, I think, is perhaps why Trump is beginning to admit it actually exists and not pretend, but he isn't yet pretending it's significant. But there will come some point, I think we're getting to the point where even some Republicans are beginning to admit it exists. And, and, you know, in case people think this is just about Trump, it all happened in the 80s with AIDS. And I knew a guy who was gay in San Francisco in the 80s, and he left America and said, I'll never live in this country again. And he moved to Saudi Arabia. And he said, it's a lot better for gay people in Saudi Arabia than it is in America under Reagan. And I said, I wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> and he said, yeah, down here, nobody cares. You can, there's wild parties at night and everything, and it's fine. And, and America is a hostile place for gays. And I said, well, this is oh. to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But under Reagan, he just pretended there was no age for like five or 10 years, did nothing. I mean, not 10 years, but for a long time. The official government position was it, it doesn't exist. And then it was, it doesn't matter because it only affects gay people. And it's just like Trump. It doesn't exist. And then it doesn't matter because it only affects Democrats. And then eventually they reach a point when they can't do that anymore. Anyway. And this is, this I thought kind of blew my mind. They made a DIY vaccine. And they published the recipe online and you can like mix it up and take it if you want to. And uh, they have not a, a bunch of scientists are doing it and they have some theory that this is the rapid deployment vaccine collaborative. So boy, I don't know. <laughs> so battery acid, HCL. Well, they, they have some kind of theory about Only nitrate. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> it's UV, it's UV light and Clorox bleach. <laughs> Yeah. Turns out that was secure the whole time. They are science enthusiasts. Why are you suggesting that they're idiots? I mean, some of them are so silly at Harvard and MIT. They must be intelligent people. Um, affiliated with. Yeah, mean, affiliated. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, they took a, 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 one, a, a, a massive uh, online course one time. So you're not like uh, lining up to take this stuff? I feel uh, like no. I feel like we should go to the biohacking village at DEF CON and mix up a pot of this and hand it out or something. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, okay, well, uh, all right. Well, you guys just got no respect for like MIT and Harvard and stuff. I guess not. You must I not mean, respect uh, science. Anyway. I, I guess not because I also don't believe that uh, the wire piece and face masks are a 5G antenna. So you're a sheeple. You've, uh, yeah. you've been <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> So, so the, the, this is the British guy, not Kirk from Florida, but the British guy did not get, get arrested. No, uh, though this does mention the Florida guy. So there's like three people they've identified so far, and they've only arrested the 17-year-old in Florida. And uh, you know, one thing I'd like to mention about this is they're immediately charging him in as an adult. They immediately published this 17 year old's mugshot everywhere uh, w with him looking sinister and people saying like, oh, he looks like a school shooter and all this stuff. And I think that's wrong. One thing I appreciate about this register article is they're not publishing a juvenile's mugshot, um, yeah. which I, I think that's just disgusting. Yeah. Um, this is not something you should be charging a kid as an adult for because you know, they're really not at that stage where they can understand the ramifications of, of these things and, and ruin their entire life over it. And it's nonviolent. So um, this kind of stuff really, I find really, I find really appalling. Um, they should be rehabbing this kid and he's obviously pretty smart. So side note, 
but uh, yeah, there are other there are other people involved in this that are in other countries. They haven't been charged yet. Um, but the fun, one of the funny things about this is that during his um, arraignment hearing, uh, it got zoom bombed with porn clips. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. Uh, but, sort of yeah. predictable. Yeah. But you know, that's why I was thinking about this when I first saw this, I said 20 years. I said, how can that be? Because in Britain, they don't give you much of a punishment for cyber crime, but it was the Americans that want to give him 20 years. So all he has to do is avoid getting extradited from Britain. Cause I remember the, Lulsec guys, Double Jake was pretty much the leader. He got like six months and then three years of no internet, and then he's back on the internet, working in the field and everything. And that seems more reasonable, you know. You're not twenty years in a clink for a thing like this. And, and I'm not real sure that would hold up. Like I'm not real sure they can get him uh, on on you know if they're uh, prosecuting under DMCA or whatever. I'm not really sure that doesn't apply to American students, or I mean American citizens. Well, uh, non American citizens, that is. Well, they try to extradite him, so apparently we have an extradition agreement with Britain and there's a possibility of it. But the thing is, they did very little harm, you know, compared to like Lulsec. It seems to me like a $500 fine and no prison time at all would be about right. All they did was post some cryptocurrency tweets or somebody, make them give back the money. And this was really a short term yeah. prank with very little consequence. Yeah, the kid is the kid in Florida is like basically a middleman, and and I just you know I think this is really, I think this is kind of thing is very short sighted. I'm sure they're trying to like make an example of him and whatnot, but uh, it, this is just stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, um, hopefully he'll get a good lawyer. And and you know, side note that uh, we can't teach kids about. Uh, hacking or ethics thing, um, you know, the abstinence only education equivalent, that's working out great, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, then this thing looked pretty good, this crocodile hunter thing. Yeah, I found this and, and I am very much interested. So you need uh, either the Blade RF or the USRP for this, but it basically is supposed to uh, help you find stingrays or hailstorms or other other devices that are listening or trying to mimic 4G stations. I saw one a while ago. Wait, 4G? Yeah, uh, telephone stations, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because I remember um, I saw one of these a couple of years ago. It was just an Android app, but I don't know how accurate it was. But it was supposedly tell you if there were any unexpected cell phone towers in your area. Yeah, so this... Uh, from the instructions, it looks like it best works on a laptop. It, you could use it on a on a Pi Four. Yeah, there are a few few little items to be aware of if you're going to use a Pi Four, but uh, supposedly it works. Yeah, I know. I remember people ran it at DefCon a couple of years ago, and they would find a lot of unauthorized towers at DefCon, which is not too surprising, really. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, and uh, all right. So we got Achilles. So we have another cell phone vulnerability. This time it's not anything to do with the CPU or the operating system. It has to do with the DSP chip. So the DSP is the, stands for additional signal processor. And basically what it does usually is convert an analog signal into a digital one or vice versa. And supposedly there's some um, vulnerabilities with this and they're not going into details, but it supposedly this, chip is in over 40% of the mobile phone market. And you can use it to essentially extract things like photos, because obviously that goes through the DSP, audio from your phone call, uh, GPS locations. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how the exfiltration works because um, the DSP chip obviously has very limited functionality that way, but maybe they're, they're using it to like pump through the, the audio jack or something. Yeah. And it looks like it affects the U.S. and European phones. Yep. Yeah, it sounds great. So they need to update their stuff. Good. And uh, so this, Rita, this thing sounded pretty good. Somebody brought this up in a Twitter thread. This is uh, something that will do network traffic analysis. And the idea is even if you're using encrypted channels, this will still figure out what happens by using uh, patterns of transmission. It'll pick up beacons from... Uh, bots and so on and dns tunnels and so on so i'd like to play with it and see how it works i've got some projects in the uh 
in the ethical hacking class where you set up DNS requests that are suspicious and then reverse engineer them. And this sounds like a great tool to play with. So I haven't tried it yet, but it's definitely a project to add to like our IR classes and hacking classes and maybe the network monitoring class, that kind of thing. And supposedly it looks for high entropy traffic, which is a pretty good way to do it. Anyway, then we got satellite internet traffic. It's one of yours, I think, Liz. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm experiencing issues over here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is it turkey related to you? But uh, yeah, that it was. I thought this was pretty interesting. It was a, a black hat talk. I couldn't find the one that I really wanted to cover. Nobody seemed to re write a story on it uh, yet. But uh, I thought this was pretty cool. Um, essentially, it was talk the these researchers found that you could um, essentially uh, perform a man in the middle attack on all kinds of different. Uh, uh, traffic using um, satellite internet and some of the most interesting ones to me were uh, the ship um, the uh, commercial shipping uh, interceptions that they pulled off so um, and and it really didn't take them much to do this it was like less than uh, 300 bucks worth of equipment so could I attack a ship that's somewhere far away on the earth this way um, theoretically, but, uh, you know, I, I imagine that, uh, you'd need to have some data on that, on that ship, you know, you'd have to be able to, um, you know, you, you couldn't do it without knowing and frequency or something. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think you'd, you need to get like, at least like some kind of, um, unique ID associated with that vessel in order to do it, whether that was, um, you know, tele even telemetry data, maybe you could use. Um, but uh, I think you'd have to get some kind of data. Um, Another so thing that occurs to me is, I guess you can't patch this until you replace the satellites. So that's like 20 years off, right? I, you know, I wondered about that. I wondered about, also wondered about, um, you know, don't you, ha don't, and Caitlin might know more about this than I do, but um, don't satellites require firmware updates at some point? Like, do, um, they push, do they push firmware updates to satellites or how they, does that work? They do. It is usually the, the software that runs on satellites, um, oh, I forgot the language, but it, it's very low level. Like the satellites run as little software as possible. The, the chips they have in, in satellites are not very powerful, mostly because when satellites go up, they went up 10 or 20 years ago, but also because the chips on the, on the satellites need to withstand high amounts of radiation. Yeah. So you have these like custom chips that are like really expensive and also really slow. And they essentially run um, a programming language that kind of looks, I wish I can remember the name of it. It's, it's not uncommon, but um, that looks like a stack essentially. And you can, you can push updates and stuff that way, but it's not running like HTTP servers or anything like that. There's right. supposed to be satellite hacking at DEF CON. Does anybody like know when that's happening or what link well, goes? There is, but you had to like qualify uh, in advance. Like there's this whole thing that you had to go through in order to qualify to do it. You can't even like watch or anything. Yeah, okay. Uh, you maybe you can watch. Yeah, yeah. But, find a link. That'd be good. I'm trying to accumulate. DefCon, by the way, is very hard to find anything. So I've been accumulating links on my homepage, and I found a thanks to Urban and such. I've got about six streams here, but uh, they're just sort of all over the place. There doesn't seem to be any central place. So it's just like real DefCon in person, then. Well, yeah. Anyway, um, so anyway, so that's cool. The satellite stuff and then we got the host file i thought this was pretty interesting speaking of telemetry yeah if you, if you are blocking windows telemetry or microsoft telemetry using the host file that's now a risk yeah. microsoft like, will block you from changing you know, the file microsoft will tell you like oh there's there's something bad happening yeah so and it, it, particularly if you try to block microsoft servers yep which is like a classic thing we've all been doing, not only to block Microsoft spying on you, but to block the stinking updates, you yep, know. Yep. So now, now you get something like that where it, even Notepad will tell you, hey, uh, 
this looks like a virus or some un unintended malware action. Now, this reminds me, there was a, there was a uh, video of Steve Jobs saying, you know, my problem with Microsoft is that their products are just so lousy. They make this junk that's so low quality. And I really feel that way. It's like, yeah, it's just having Microsoft is like having like a broken leg that just keeps hampering everything you do and hurting. And it's just so annoying. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, so for, uh, I don't know if it's applied now or it's going to be applied, uh, but you'll start, you will start, if not already, start seeing this uh, happening if you edit that in DNS or you edit the host file. Yep, yep. Well, it's, uh, all right. And then we got Facebook fired the employees. So what's the deal here? So one of the Facebook employees gathered data on the type of content that would otherwise violate Facebook rules, but they look the other way. Yeah. And in most of those cases, it's almost always right-wing content. Yeah. And this is a, a common theme in American media, where for whatever reason, Americans are very conservative in the language that they will accept. So it's not uncommon to hear a far right-wing talking point like communism is bad, and we need to keep it out of our countries and they'll air it and no one really gets offended. Um, but if you were to make the same statement on the other side, like, oh, communism's actually really good. Um, that usually gets shut off the air right away <laughs> yeah. for obvious reasons um, if you live in America. So uh, that bias has creeped into Facebook's algorithms. And so they're one of the people calling it out just got fired for pointing out that there's a right-wing bias over at Facebook, which it, it surprised no one. <laughs> yeah. Much. yeah. I mean, Zuckerberg has partnered with Trump and partnered with the right. That's really been his position, whereas Twitter opposed them all. I think Zuckerberg had begun taking down stuff like that. Axios interview, Trump said kids are immune to coronavirus. And I think Zuckerberg even took that down. So right. we're beginning, he's beginning to go so far that even Facebook won't let it on. So I guess it'll just be on like Parler and, uh, and Breitbart and stuff. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, it speaks to a bigger issue um, I've seen in American politics. I'm not going to take sides, um, but I have noticed that most outlets in America skew at least partially to the right. Uh, like CNN has a huge corporate bias. And even though it's, it's they largely are try to remain neutral, they still do have that that corporate bias. And they do, they do a lot of both sides-isms I've seen where they take one side that's obviously right. And then because they want to get both sides, they take a side that's obviously wrong. <laughs> yeah, this and, is the policy equivalence. The New York Times does it too. And yeah. I understand it because 30% of Americans have drifted off into insanity, which mm -hmm. used to just be the weekly world news. And they believe there is no virus. Uh, the government is conspiring against you. The scientists are all lying. There's a cure mm -hmm. and they're hiding it. And that how do you deal with that? If you want to appeal to everybody, you have to say, yeah, if you accept half lies mixed in with the truth, or you have to accept being rejected by some large portion of people as totally biased. Right. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fresh. Oh, go on. I was just going to say, I think it's higher than 30% even now that people believe this crap. Right. Well, the, the, the frustrating part, of course, is that there's this right-wing narrative that the news is left-winging and has all this, this left-wing bias. And as someone previous in a previous life was doing news for, for an old college newspaper, I, I can assure you that it, it's frustrating to, to hear people complain about left-wing biases in, in conservative media. Well, I, I understand it because if you actually care about science and truth, then you're way over on the left in modern America, where the whole right is off in fantasy land. It's, I wouldn't I, say that, but, well, I'm try, but, I'm, I, I, but you can say it. And I, well, I mean, and I, you know, I'm trying to figure out whether I should leave the country or stay here and try to be part of fixing it. Um, I, I flop back and forth between these alternatives. And I think it'll basically be based on next election. I think if Trump right. wins again, I'll just abandon America and leave, saying that these guys obviously are beyond saving. But if Biden wins, maybe I'll stick around to be part of the attempt to like clean up the mess that's created. But the problem is, Trump won before and somebody like him could win again. America just suffers from some kind of collective insanity. This is what happened to Athens. The people are just too stupid to govern themselves. 
but but also also keep in mind that this can happen in any country and has happened in other countries yeah. and we always knew it could happen here in america that it took a while it took a while but you know i i i, I well that's an based on one. based on my my gut feelings which are which are right 50 percent of the time um i don't think trump is going to win this election well that would i didn't think he was going to win the last one either but see, the question is, way. what can we do to fix this situation where 40% of Americans are completely insane and they're so stupid they can't even be trusted to look out for their own welfare? They're like, they're like crazy people that need to be locked in a padded cell. That's see, I thought this in 2016, and that was what brought me to teaching in the first place. Uh, because, you know, as upset as I was when this happened. I just wanted to, you know, burn everything down for a while. And I was like, well, what got us here? It's ignorance. What can I do about this? Uh, In the long maybe- run, I think education is the answer, but it's slow. It's and, real slow. And, you know, it, like I think everyone in Hong Kong is having exactly the same discussion. Do we stay here and try to fix it or do we flee before they close the border? It's a very similar situation as your country goes insane. And I read Steppenwolf. Steppenwolf was written about exactly this. He was in Germany in the 1930s, and he was facing exactly this. Do I stay here or do I flee before they close the borders? And it's a, it's, it's a hard it's, decision. Yeah, it really is. It's hard to know because I've been having that same dilemma. Like, do I try to, you know, just dig in here? Um, you know, especially because I'm coming to the place where I need to transition my living situation. I'm like, do I, you know, find a permanent place here or do I just get the hell out before it's too late to go anywhere? Because, I mean, already we're at the point where it's hard to go any place. Yeah. Even if, you know, even if I wanted to leave tomorrow, that would, you know, options that I had six months ago are not open to me now. Yeah, well, we can't leave for about a year. The only hope of ever leaving is if Biden wins. And within about a year, he'll be able to get the virus under control. So in about a year and a half, there will be a brief window when Americans can actually escape. And then if we have another Republican administration, the borders will be closed again as they create some kind of Nazi Germany over here. And I think, um, you know, it's logically, it will be a matter of watching and deciding if we're actually improving as a country or if we're just going to sink back into the filth. It's uh, so I'm, I'm watching. I have no choice but to stay here for another year, and I'm I'm watching to decide what the right move is. Now, one thing I you know I was gonna a couple times in my life I was gonna be a monk, and one thing you do as a monk is you have to take a vow of stability, and you stay no matter what happens because you're gonna like try and save the people around you. But I didn't do that. You know, I, I'm not required to do that. <laughs> but that's certainly one position to take. Is there are people I know who are patriotic and say I'm gonna save America? I think America is great, and you know I don't really. I actually think America should have just stayed as part of the British Empire. I don't think we made any sense to rebel. I don't think our excessive individualism was actually that smart. We modeled it after the French revolutionaries, and those guys were just a bunch of slavering lunatics like the Taliban. I'm, I think I, I would have no problem moving to Europe. I think I feel more like they have a sensible plan than we do. <laughs> I think we're just too big to, go, you know, it's not a sustainable it's not a sustainable thing to govern this as one country anymore, I don't think. That's one option would be to split up the country. I don't know if that would work. Anyway, no, we're certainly reaching a, one, one thing I will say, we are facing a crisis with very little violence. Although maybe I shouldn't say that because the coronavirus has killed more yeah. people. Yeah. I wouldn't, yeah, I don't know. It's a different kind of violence. We aren't having an yeah. obvious civil war. Would the you- other thing, yeah, the other thing is, is I think that uh, we're only kind of on the precipice of, of how bad it's going to get because people are about to get starting evicted out of their homes with nothing, with no, no way to, with nothing. They're, and what, what, what's going to happen when you turn, push, push out millions of people onto the streets with nothing? Then you've got like the Great Depression kind of times. And remember, this is what Obama prevented the Great Depression with TARP. I was very impressed by that. I would not have done it. It violated all economic theory, but he knew it was better to just throw $10 trillion on the ground and let the bank steal it than to let everybody become homeless. And that turned out to be the correct move. But they can't do it this time. So it it is, anyway, we're living through an exciting experiment in government and sociology, for what it's worth. Very much like watching Hitler rise in Germany. There was something going on that that you're going to write textbooks about and analyze for centuries afterwards. 
anyway. Um, so That's scary. we got uh, this one was interesting. The predictive policing straight out of minority report. This has been coming around for like 10 years. They're going to predict who's going to commit crimes and like arrest them in advance or send cops there in advance. And it turns out, as you would imagine, that this doesn't work at all. All that happens is to either make mistakes in the software or it just develops like racial bigotry because it looks like reports. And of course, that's how the cops become bigots too. If you just look at the reports, certain minority groups are committing more crimes. And if you don't think any further than that, that's it. That's your prediction, which is why, you know, in uh, Israel, I've been told at the airports, they just practice racial profiling. That's how they protect the airports. And you can make policing based on that model, but most of us are not happy with the side effects of that model. But uh, an AI will just do that. So anyway, it's interesting to watch. And I think it's got to do with, uh, I think this is a lot of why face, everybody backed away from facial recognition, because this is what everybody wanted to do, was to use it for terror, anti-terrorism and policing. And they rapidly discovered that it was not improving policing. It was in fact, bringing up the worst kind of policing. <laughs> the robots are not smarter than humans yet. But anyway. it, it, it always impresses me, the fact that we finally are at the point where we're trying to make artificial intelligence and we accidentally make it all racist. <laughs> well, it becomes racist for the same reason the people did. If you're kind of stupid and you just look at a sample set, then the first thing you notice is, oh, gee, this one race commits more crime. There, I've solved the problem. It's well, no, the, the, the sample sets are biased. I mean, it, it really shows you how deep uh, systemic racism goes, yeah. that yeah. Our, our sample sets and our, and I'm not just talking about like policing. Uh, they, they, I mean, the they, part of it is like, part of it is to the people that are making this technology. I mean, we just had to dump the um, terrible privacy violating spyware that they were using at CCSF to administer uh, proctored tests because the, um, they had this awful feature that would take pictures of the students' uh, photo IDs and it wouldn't recognize any students with a darker skin tone. Hmm. I didn't know about that. Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's true. That's it's people, people that are making this technology, you know, they're less than, less than 10% of the tech industry in general is not a straight white or Asian male. Yeah. So, you know, what do we expect at a certain point? Yep, yep. It's it's an interesting issue. People people think technology can solve everything, and of course, AI is not smarter than people. It's just smart enough to take some of the most simple, repetitive tasks away from us at the moment. Anyway, then we got messing with traffic lights. Boy, that would be fun. <laughs> It is, and scary. These researchers did a um, pretty cool presentation on this. Essentially, uh, they have a, what's a smartphone app that was designed to help um, to give, essentially how like ambulances can trigger a green light when they hit the intersection. This phone app was designed to uh, trigger green lights when cyclists reach the intersection. And um, the researchers were able to uh, spoof the messaging protocol with like a basic Python script. Yep, because it wasn't encrypted or anything. Right. Yeah, but it makes sense. It reminds me of the guy that just did it with a wheelbarrow full of iPhones. Just yeah. rolls the cart with 100 iPhones down the street and creates a traffic jam. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. That, well, that was a little different because the, the guy with the 100 iPhones was uh, essentially um, get, feeding bad data to Google Maps to reroute traffic. And this it was actually messing with the uh, traffic, the city traffic uh, light system itself. But he tested it in San Francisco. It works there. Wow. This makes me feel like assigning homework. Anyway, <laughs> I might get in trouble if my students went and fouled up San Francisco traffic. Yeah, I don't think, I think physically violent Python might be an issue. Yeah, just no fun. But you do have tenure, so. Yeah, but you know, there might be some authorities beyond the college that would get sore at night. Eh, they'd have to catch you first. And well, if I'm just didn't... publishing it on the internet, then I'm not hiding as much as you might want. <laughs> well, still, though, I mean, they don't have a great track record as far 
far as doing their due diligence goes. That's true. They might like blame some other teacher near me that looks more like, you know. They probably vulnerable. wouldn't even blame a teacher at all. They'd probably like blame the uh, Russians or something. This reminds me a few years ago when the guys in, in uh, some southern state blamed me for this medical stuff and they just sent emails a computer science teacher in San Francisco caused all this trouble and ran around trying to figure out whose fault it was. And after about three days, they sent me an email and said, is this you? And I'm like, oh, uh, hmm, yeah, that kind of is me, actually. Yeah. Nobody, <laughs> nobody covered the, the black hat um, talk that I really wanted to report the news about, which was uh, the way that this pharmaceutical company essentially paid uh like a million dollars to be able to modify this doctor's uh decision support tool um so that it would uh consistently spit out recommendations to prescribe their company's opioids hmm. um, oh great <laughs> yeah yeah is that's, that's like yeah. the new one from cashmere hill where she found out that this like mental health app was just giving their staff burner phones to post fake good reviews to make it look popular when it wasn't popular and stuff. <laughs> and then taking the confidential counseling sessions and using it for marketing purposes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty awesome stuff, you know. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a real scoop. Anyway, and then we got your smart speaker. Yeah, this is great. Let's just put a speaker in everybody's home. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, accidentally was listening <laughs> to everything and everyone, and it just so happens to happen right as Google is trying to get into an ADT deal. A what deal? With ADT, the company who does um, uh, home security. Oh, I don't know them. Okay. Yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're they show up everywhere. So uh, the, the, home alarm alarm the person sounds like a crook and then call the cops to come shoot them and it'll just be like your kid playing a video game or something? Basically. <laughs> that would yeah, be so awesome. They're, they're trying to make a partnership. I'm sure they're selling all your data. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Critical yeah, thing. It accidentally was, uh, was on and, and they rolled it back after everybody complained and fired at them. Well, I'm just thinking uh, but, if people watch cop shows with car chases and guns and they play video games, how could you possibly tell a real crime from just normal life? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I hear on the police scanner a lot of the time they have these expensive shot spotter systems, uh, which are like essentially installed with uh, microphones throughout the city where uh, that are connected to some kind of AI software on the back end that are supposed to detect gunshots. But hell, half the time they can't tell a difference between gunshots and fireworks or a car backfiring. Well, yeah, yeah. but that actually makes some sense. I mean, they geolocate it and the cops go there and take a look. Whereas doing yeah, it inside your house it. makes a well, lot less sense. I, I remember playing around with some of these smart speakers about a year ago and I would de-auth them. And then the last packet they would send would, would, for whatever reason, just be encrypted with all zeros. And so I could decrypt the last packet sent. <laughs> and I'm thinking if this thing is, is recording all the time and sending data, and I just constantly like deauth it, grab the data, deauth it, grab the data. I mean, you could just use that to listen in on people. It's like the SSL uh, renegotiation vulnerabilities. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Yeah. And also then there's that, that other tool we were looking at earlier where it can analyze encrypted traffic without decrypting it. You can learn a lot without decrypting it by just looking at the size of the packets and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's a brave new world. Yep. So if you could compromise somebody's uh, login credentials, it'd be easy to tell when somebody's home or not home. Mm -hmm. You know, for your internet stalking and or robbery purposes. <laughs> Well, all right. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop the recording unless you got any more comments. Other than we're on uh, later today. In I I oh, we are. That's right. We're doing the Violent Python 3, but there's limited to 40 people, which is kind of a shame. But anyway, that's it. At Hope, we did like 200. But yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, that's their limit. I mean, we can always go into Zoom and... Well, and you know, I feel like we probably ought to like comply. I, I guess... What? Who are you and what have you done with yeah. Zoom? Seriously, uh, I'm, I'm like, I've been, 
I've been complying with a lot of these arbitrary authorities lately. I must what? be getting soft in my old age. How, 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 what has that done for you? Eh, things are moving along, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. So, so we were, Liz, we were talking about, uh, uh, we're not recording, right? No, I'm still recording. Yeah. I'm going to turn it off.